Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the episode three of Urban Log Webinars by the ITDP India program. I am Kashmira Dabash, the moderator for this webinar. And before we get into it, I would just like to thank all of those who have been following Urban Log uh, for the previous two webinars. We thank you for all your support and feedback, and we hope you continue following the rest of our webinars. So our big question today, have Indian cities done enough to ensure that people get access to high quality, frequent and reliable public transport? So some cities like uh, Ahmedabad, Pune, and now Hubli Darwar have actually joined the bandwagon of implementing the bus rapid transit system or the BRT as it's popularly known. And they have done some great things and somewhere they may have gone wrong. But here we have our three expert panelists. We have Ratnam, who is the ITDP India Program um, Research Associate for Transport Planning. And he is here to talk about BRT basics and be asked, basically answering why BRT? Why should cities even think about choosing a BRT? Then we have um, our uh, expert Abhijit Lokre, who is the co-founder at Urban Lab. Abhijit, thank you very much for joining this webinar and co-hosting it with ITDP. Uh, Abhijit has been instrumental in, in, in designing some of these BRTs in Ahmedabad, Surat, Publi Darwar, and Vadodra. And finally, our third panelist is Shreya Gadapalli, the South Asia program lead at IDDP and she, with her 20 years of experience in designing and implementing high quality BRTs, complete streets and transit oriented development. We will have a discussion with all three of them towards the very end of the webinar. So before we start, I would just like to know how many bus lovers we actually have on this webinar today. So I'm launching a poll and I would like you all to answer whether you currently use your city bus or a BRT as your daily commute. I hope you received this poll. You just need to click on yes or no. Still going. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. So 67% of you have said that, no, oh, you don't use a city bus or a BRT as part of a daily commute. Well, that's fine. After this webinar, maybe you're converted and you hop onto your bus the very next day. So um, let's start off the webinar with uh, Ratnam. Thanks a lot, Ratnam, over to you. Okay. Okay, uh, let me take a step back here and first talk about how buses itself perform in India. Uh, let's start uh, looking at how buses elsewhere are. Um, now, London has about 16,000 different buses, that is more than 9,000 uh, buses they have, most of which are double decker. Um, and Shenzhen was recently in the news for having the biggest fleet of electric buses. They have about 16,000 electric buses in service now. Um, now let's see how Indian cities fare. Um, according to the level of, uh, according to the service level benchmark set by uh, MOHOA for urban transport, uh, Indian cities should have more than 60 buses per lakh population uh, to have level of service one, to, to achieve level of service one, that is. Uh, now most Indian, in fact, no Indian city uh, has uh, as many buses. Uh, you can see in the slide here, Bangalore has about 60 buses per lakh population. Otherwise, everyone is around 30 or 25 buses per lakh population. Um, 
and when you compare it with other cities elsewhere like singapore london hong kong and beijing all of them have more than 100 buses per lakh population um however uh, the population of private motor vehicles has been on the rise uh since 2005 uh, you can see here uh, it is growing at seven to eight times than the population growth rate uh, this is alarming and uh, the next slide you'll see uh, the at the same time there's there's no uh, rise in the uh, fleet of bus buses as well and the ridership in bus buses has also been on the decline or is it it is stagnating um, for example, uh, Chennai, used to, Chennai MTC buses used to have 50 lakh uh, trips per day in 2010. Uh, right now, they're doing only 40 uh, lakh trips. In, in fact, uh, the ridership is, on, is dropping in Mumbai as well, where uh, it has gone down to 29 lakh now from previously when it was 4.5 million. Um, even that has been the case uh, in London and New York as well. How are we responding to this? Uh, is the question now. Uh, even with a decline in bus ridership, um, in many cities, buses are the major mode of public transport. Uh, you can see here in London, with more than 400 kilometers of underground and overground uh, metro, uh, buses cater to 62% of public transport trips. Uh, and it is similar in India, except for uh, Mumbai, Mumbai being the only outlier. Uh, Delhi, even with its a 300 kilometer network of metro has more than 5 million trips on buses. Uh, and that's the case in Chennai as well. Uh, suburban ca uh, caters to 10 lakh trips, um, and which is similar in Kolkata as well. Um, so how, how do we respond to this problem of uh, declining ridership? Uh, it is evident that we should imp improve the level of service on buses, but uh, is adding more buses alone uh, enough? Uh, you can see here this picture is from Guangzhou. In Guangzhou, uh, buses are stuck in buses were stuck in traffic. Now, how did the city respond to this? It created a BRT or bus rapid transit, uh, get central uh, dedicated lanes for buses so they can move faster in without traffic. Now, what is BRT? Uh, now, according to uh, the U.S. Federal Transit uh, Administration, it is a rapid mode of transportation that combines the quality of rail and rail transit and the flexibility of buses. Now, flexibility is the best thing about buses. Buses, it's not like a metro line where you build a line and it ends over there. Uh, buses can leave the corridor, serve uh, serve extended areas of this uh, extended areas of the city as well. Um, now, uh, where, where all has BRT been implemented? Uh, now I'll go through a few pictures of where it has been done. One, uh, this is from uh, Bogota, and Bogota, then uh, Mexico City, uh, Yichang in China, and uh, Jakarta as well. Um, now, what, what is BRT? Uh, what are the different uh, parts of a BRT? Uh, BR For bus rapid transit, we need a uh, buses need dedicated right of way um, and the lane should be in the middle of the road. Uh, what is the capacity of a road? Uh, usually the question is, you're taking away uh, road space, road space is precious, how do we use it? Uh, now a six lane road you can see here can carry 3000 people per hour per direction in peak. Um, the same road with a four, four lane elevated uh, road can add only 60% of uh, capacity. But if you add a BRT system to the same road um, at about 20 to 25 rupees, 20 to 25 crore per kilometer, uh, you, you add a capacity of about four, 400 to 1000 uh, percent. That uh, BRT systems can do uh, from 10,000 to 45,000, uh, can carry about 10 to 45,000 people per hour per direction. Uh, now again, uh, coming back to the different parts of BRT, uh, buses, bus lanes should be medium. Uh, why shouldn't they be on uh, the sides of the road? That is the usual question. Well, uh, if it is on the side of the road, there are uh, frequent interruptions because of side roads, parking, and all of that. So bus lanes should be in the middle, um, followed by platform level boarding. Now, what delays uh, 
uh, boarding at bus stations right now. Uh, our buses are not low flow. Most of our buses have uh, more than three steps to board. Uh, by the time you board the bus, like people sitting in the bus are like, like, how much more time will you wait for it? And also they're not accessible for people uh, on wheelchairs and the elderly as well. Uh, with BRT, we'll have uh, level boarding and people uh, with disabilities and elderly can access the buses easily. Um, another thing is uh, off-board fare collection. Uh, off-board fare collection will again uh, increase the boarding times and reduce, uh, like usually what, what you would see in Indian cases is the conductor, the, the bus might start from your location, uh, but immediately after a few, uh, small time, they'll stop to issue tickets. Uh, with off-board fare collection, you remove that problem and also uh, adding cards will uh, will allow people to uh, transfer between modes. Uh, then um, along with this, uh, BRTs require inter intersection treatments as well, uh, along uh, with uh, uh, transit priority signals. That that will ensure buses don't uh, get stuck in the lane. Also, increase the speed uh, of the BRT. Um, now, the uh, there is a BRT standard that is, uh, you can access this on ITDP's website. There's also a BRT planning guide. Along with this, IRC uh, Indian Roads Congress has recently published a guideline for BRTs. Um, you can access that as well. Um, now, I'll close the presentation with a video. Thanks for that, Ratnam. Uh, Ratnam, before uh, Abhiji pops onto the webinar, I just wanted to um, ask you one question. You mentioned that the BRT provides this metro-like quality but with the flexibility of a bus. Would you be able to expand a little on that? And that also happens to be Abhishek Kumar's question. Um, yeah. Um, when I say metro-like quality, uh, you have level boarding, off-board ticketing. Um, but uh, the thing with metro lines is they might, uh, they, they are uh, limited by the rail. Uh, they can, um, and that, that is not, and bus is not limited, but buses are not limited by rail. Bus, buses can uh, go wherever the road is. In fact, uh, um, Take the case of Pune BRT. Pune BRT is a hybrid uh, BRT where buses can enter and exit the corridor anywhere. Um, that that is what has been planned for Chennai as well, with um, where bus routes can access three different corridors and also exit the corridor and serve the areas outside, um, which can which is not 
possible uh, by a rail line. Um, in, if, it, if it were a rail line and there were three corridors, you would still um, want have to uh, transfer between lines as well. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, that, that's it. Sure, thanks Ratnam. And just to add on that, um, the, the metro like quality, you could also add, I mean, the convenience of, uh, of, the, of metro in terms of comfort. And would that also mean quality like metro? Sure. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'll answer this. Uh, so when you say a comfort or quality of a metro, we're saying when BRT uh, will be operational, uh, it is it will not be the same old buses. Uh, when we are, uh, when we ask for a BRT, there should be good quality buses as well. Uh, good quality buses maintained well can give you the same comfort. Uh, like a metro. In fact, uh, with BRT, we can have better frequencies, better speeds. So you'll get uh, the same level of service. Thanks a lot, Ratnam. Uh, Abhijit, can I please request you to share your screen now? Yeah. Yeah, give me a sec, please. Abhiji? Yeah, just give me a sec. Um... Abhijit, can I please request you to share your screen? Sorry, there seems to be a bit of a technical glitch. Yeah, is the screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay, yeah. So I had some error and no worry. Logged out. Okay, hi. Good evening, everybody. This is Abhijit Lokre, and uh, Kashmir has already introduced me. So I've been involved with planning and designing of uh, BRT systems in India, I think for the last 15 years now, right? And you just started off with Ahmedabad, Surat, was involved in Indore. Hubli uh, Dharwad, later with Amritsar. Uh, so you could say I've kind of seen most of it in the last 15 years. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is take on from uh, what Sri Ratnam uh, shared and uh, also see what is happening with BRTS in India. Okay, so currently BRTS in India is an endangered species, right? We don't have many new BRTS coming in and whatever exists uh, are facing a lot of issues. If we take a look at the map showing BRTS in India, we have 11 BRTS operational in India. Okay, but that comes with the rider and I'll talk about that. We have Chennai which is currently planning, preparing their uh, detailed project report for the, for the BRTS. For five cities, we really don't know what has happened. They, they were talking about BRTS at some point in time, and now we don't know what's happening there. And of course, we have Delhi's example, which was dismantled. It was the first city, uh, probably the second after Pune, but the first city which actually talked about BRTS. Unfortunately, it has been dismantled. Out of the 11 cities that are operational currently in India, I would say Ahmedabad, Surat, Indore, Pimpri, Pune, and probably Hubli Dharwad are functioning at some level, while most of the others, we really don't know what's happening there. Now let's contrast this with what is happening with metro systems in India. So with metro systems in India, 
we have 10 of them operational and they're fast catching up. Uh, and in fact, if I actually, uh, you know, divide Delhi, New Delhi is actually also Ghaziabad, it's also Noida, it's also Faridabad. Uh, if I look at Mumbai, uh, somehow I think I've missed Mumbai here, but Mumbai is actually Mumbai. They are also expanding into Thane and Navi Mumbai. And there are many more uh, metro systems which, where the DPR is uh, under preparation or they are at some stage of approval. And we have cities like Agra, Kanpur, Varanasi, Patna, uh, also in the mix. In fact, I have heard that uh, Ilhabad also is now planning a metro system and so is uh, Dehradun. So if the BRTS, nothing new has been planned after 2013, most of the new metro systems that are being planned and even implemented today have come up after 2013. If you look at BRTS in India, and if you look at where we are compared to other parts of the world, we started taking off somewhere in 2007, somewhere here. And this is all we have managed to do till 2013. We added a little bit more in the form of Hubli Dharwad after that, but really nothing more. But if you look at the other areas around the world, they are expanding rapidly. So there is something that is clearly working there and something that is probably not working in India. Let's also look at how many cities and the number of kilometers that they had planned. So Indore, Pune and Ahmedabad were the first three cities sometime in 2006. And they were uh, uh, under the, uh, the Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission. Uh, they were allotted funds to implement their BRTS. So just look, take a look at Pune's figures. Pune got funds for about 115 kilometers. But they were unable to build all of them. We have no clue about Pimpri Chinchwad. Probably ITDP would know more about that. Take a look at Ahmedabad and Surat. They were able to achieve most of what they had planned. Jaipur planned about 40 kilometers and they are operating about 7 kilometers. Vijayawada, Vishakapatnam, we have no clue what's happening there. Delhi, unfortunately, has been dismantled. The two new additions to the list is Amritsar and Hubli Dharwad. Amritsar with 30 kilometers had started operations. Hubli Dharwad is also starting operations soon. Now the thing here is, in 15 years or say 14 years, we planned for 615 kilometers, out of which only half of them are actually operational. In other words, in 14 years, we have built 310 kilometers, or we are saying 22 kilometers every year, or say 1.8 kilometers BRTS we have built every month in the last 14 years. Now, when I said BRTS is endangered, why do I say that? I think some of the answers are already in the numbers that I just shared with you. But let's look at some of the reasons. See, one is that there is absolutely no ownership about the BRTS. Few leaders are ready to withstand scrutiny about the BRTS. And let me tell you, uh, it is much, much easier to build a metro than to build a BRTS. Once the metro alignment is final, the engineers will take over and they can build the metro easily. There is nothing to it. But if you talk about BRTS, you have to implement it, you have to execute it on a stretch which already exists and you will have to take away road space. This road space will either be from traffic or from parking. The Indian experience also has been that it takes a long time to build BRTS and politicians don't want to wait for such a long time. For them, the flyovers and bridges are much faster to build and they don't have such problems at, like the BRTS, especially in execution. It's controversial. There are political uncertainties in building a BRTS. The second problem that uh, BRTS in India faced were legal issues. So there were public interest litigations filed in Delhi, Indore and Ahmedabad. In Delhi, the High Court permitted other vehicles to first enter the, B the BRT corridor 
later on they were prohibited in indore the high court permitted other vehicles inside the judgment and this this is a long story in indore the judgment was split between two judges one of them said uh, you know vehicles can be allowed inside uh, the other judge said no it can't be allowed inside and so the verdict was split one one and it took about a year for it to go to another judge who then said that vehicles have to be removed but this was a temporary stay so even today in indore there is no permanent order given by the court about whether other vehicles can be allowed inside the corridor or not now that meant that indore has been reluctant to expand because they say we are uncertain whether whatever we even have today will be allowed to run in the future or not and if you remember the slide i had shown about the metro indore has already gone ahead and they are planning their metro Ahmedabad was probably the only city where high court the high court refused hearing of the public interest litigation saying that they are not competent to give any judgment on this this is purely an administrative and technical matter that the municipal corporation can take care of so one of the question that comes to mind is that there is a metro act do we also at some point need a brts act this is how the delhi corridor looked after all vehicles were allowed inside the corridor now because i have been involved with the brts for so long and you know i you can say that i am one of the culprits on this for a long long time in india all the debates that we did was about infrastructure now i have lost count of the number of times we had this debate about how many meters for bus lanes how many meters for other vehicles how wide should a footpath be and these are all important but somehow very less attention was given to demand analysis to operations planning to business models to procurement to institutional integration one of the reasons was many of the detailed project reports were not prepared by planners but they were prepared by engineers because engineers were supposed to implement the brts on ground so they did most of the work uh, in the early days and in 2005 6 7 there were very few consultants who actually understood brts or had even planned brts probably itdp was one of the only people only organization at that point who had some experience in brts and finally when we build all these corridors in the early days in cities like pune in delhi we had the same old buses running in newly constructed corridors with the same old route structure so for a commuter whom we were asking to move to the bus nothing had really changed this was pune in the earlier days this is a segregated corridor and you can see the same kind of buses inside buses people still spilling over from the bus stop waiting to board the bus this is ahmedabad now i was very closely involved in ahmedabad and if you can follow the pointer the orange line is basically showing this is a brt corridor all the orange is the brt corridor on which amts buses the old bus service in ahmedabad continues to run and if you look at this central corridor and compare it with the brts which is the green line here you will see that the amts buses actually do more service kilometers than the brts on the brts corridors which means that there was absolutely no route rationalization done there was no integration between amts and brts and this is in a city that is known or considered to be a successful example of brts we had absolutely no focus on policy no policy integration one of the conditions of the jnnurm was that cities would have a parking policy now if i can re uh, recollect and maybe shreya can later fill in the, fill, fill in for this pune has recently got a parking policy very recent ahmedabad still does not have a policy surat got it last year there are no other policies as far as non motorized transport is concerned no policy on that we have no attempt to disincentivize private transport 
In fact, we are building more and more flyovers. We are widening roads. And except for a few cities, no other city showed expanded system. So Jaipur remained at 7, Delhi remained at 5.6, Indore is still continuing at 11.65. Except for Ahmedabad, which is close to 100, Surat, which is close to 100, and Pune, which has expanded, none of the other cities have expanded. Ahmedabad itself has built more than 50 flyovers in the last 10 years. Just think about that. 50 flyovers in the last five years. That is after in the last 10 years, sorry. And that is after building the BRTS. Many of these new flyovers are actually on BRTS corridors. This defeats the very purpose of BRTS. Why would I want to travel in such a beautiful public transport? I have no idea where this photo is from. Somebody had sent this to me on WhatsApp saying this is the new India. And I was wondering what is, what is all this? Here you have a metro running on the third level. A flyover for mixed traffic on the second level. And yet another road at the ground level. Why would anybody want to travel in this public transport? Even I would never go on this. These roads are all available for me. The fourth problem that I have identified is poor maintenance and zero innovation. So we know how to build, but we don't know how to maintain. Most of the BRTS infrastructure that I have seen in India, most cities is now broken down. There are no new ideas coming in. There is no attempt to innovate. Kuritiba, which started in 1972, still continues to innovate. They are adding new buses. They are adding new operations plan. They are linking this with their city center and pedestrianization plans. Bogota, 20 years later, continues to innovate. They are now gone for bi-articulated buses. They have gone for great separated junctions only for the buses. And so does others. And so have other cities like Jakarta, Santiago, Mexico City. They continue to innovate. So if you don't innovate, you're not going to sustain. This is a picture from Ahmedabad from the first corridor. Absolutely no maintenance. You can see the condition of the wires here. You can see the condition of the advertisement boards. The doors are not in poor, not in good condition. The plantation has gone for a toss. So maintenance is really poor. And this is not only for Ahmedabad. Most of our BRTS system have this problem. And you know, we talked earlier about flexibility, that BRTS is flexible. It can actually go anywhere. It doesn't need rail or it doesn't need an overhead gantry or an overhead electric line. Unfortunately, in India, this very flexibility has become the biggest liability. Because in many cities, decision makers chose not to build the BRTS corridor in certain sections. Ahmedabad is an example, where in the old city, where we actually required segregation to allow the bus to move fast, the city chose not to segregate. And buses were allowed to run mixed with other traffic. Now, in these sections, speeds have reduced to 13 kilometers per hour, while in segregated sections, speeds are as high as 25 kilometers per hour. Again, decision makers were not willing to invest in high quality buses, non AC buses, and Pune still continues with non AC buses in spite of having built a lot of infrastructure. Because again, we you know, equate flexible with cheap. There is a lot of cost cutting done in BRTS. In Ahmedabad, again specifically, in many locations, bus stations were not built at all. So there was a corridor, but no bus stations. Now, obviously, that is not going to help. And generally, overall, extremely poor quality infrastructure. Now, should we save the BRTS? Let's take a look at this example from Ahmedabad. This was done when I was working with uh, SEPT University. This is an example from Ahmedabad. This is a junction called Manekbag. And if you take a look at this graphic and, and the numbers here, there are two buses here occupying a length of about 24 meters, an area of about 84 square meters, moving about 150 people, assuming 75 people in one bus. And here you have this traffic piled up on the other side. 
moving about 77 people in an area 486 square meters, a queue length of 54 meter. And here we have a cycle length or a signal cycle length of two minutes. This is the current situation. Now we did some extrapolation and we said all these two wheelers were replaced by cars. And that is what is actually happening. The number of cars are increasing. The number of people moved reduces from 77 to 45 only. So now instead of 150 people, you will actually be moving only one third of them. Okay, then we said, what will happen if the BRTS was not built at all? If BRTS were removed, what is going to happen here is that now you're going to move about 240 people. You're going to have a queue length of about 160 meters and your signal cycle is going to go to three minutes. And this is actually happening on many stretches in Ahmedabad in the old city where the BRTS was not built at all or it was built and then some sections were removed. The overall traffic speed has, re has reduced the overall and I'm not talking only of buses. The cars, the two wheelers, everything has slowed down now. In a way, the BRTS is like investing in the future. It's like putting money in the bank for your future. And when I said it's an en endangered species, it is exactly like the tiger. The BRTS is at the apex of urban mobility. It's not the metro. The metro is not at the apex of urban mobility. It's the BRT. If you don't build the BRT or if you remove the BRT 10 years later, I guarantee nothing is going to move. Some closing thoughts. Can we save the BRTS in India? How can we save the BRTS in India? Now, these are broad ideas and I'm sure each city will have specific ideas to put in action. One thing is that the, our approach to BRTS is absolutely piecemeal, fragmented. At the national level, at the ministry level, we have no clarity how do we tackle BRTS? How do we, what do we do with even the cities that have BRTS existing? And if you look at all those cities, Ahmedabad, Surat, Indore, Bhopal, all of them, Pune, Pimpri Chinchwad, are also building the metro. So what does the national government think about this? There has to be some integrated thought about this. The other is funding. From where can we get in funding? Is there some way in which private sector can get involved? Should we involve the private sector or not? What about ownership of the project? Many a times the ownership was never taken up by the local government. And that resulted in cities like Jaipur, where the municipal corporation never invested in the BRTS. Then let's look at Delhi's example. The government removed what we built. Can we have some kind of a legal protection? For example, a BRTS act, which makes it even removal has to go through a process. It can't be so easy to remove a public transport system. And the last idea, how can we create capacity to plan, design and operate bus systems? Capacity for consultants, capacity for private sector, capacity for bus operators. A lot has moved in the last 14 years, but really we require to build capacity. Last thoughts. BRTS is inexpensive to build, but that is it. It is inexpensive. It is not cheap to build. It is difficult to build, definitely. It is difficult to maintain and operate, but that is because either we lack capacity or we don't have proper maintenance regime. The final thing is really BRTS is inevitable. We don't have a choice. Take a look at the number shared in the earlier presentation. The best cities, the best rail cities, the best metro cities still carry more people by bus. We really don't have a choice. Bangalore bus speeds drop down to five kilometers, six kilometers during peak hours. We really have no choice. We have to build more BRTS in India. Thank you.
Thanks a lot for that, Abhijit. That was an excellent presentation. And like you correctly said, the, we can no longer afford to have the BRT as the en endangered species of India. Rather, cities need to be investing into its future and BRT is one such way. So um, just on that point, I would like to invite Shreya Gadapalli for this panel discussion. We have lots of questions coming, um, coming your way along with the other panelists. Um, so just to first of all begin with, Abhijit correct, rightfully says this, that there's, there's just too much focus on the infrastructure of the BRT. And right before this webinar, we were having a discussion about BRT not being a, BRT not being this infrastructural project, but rather an integrated system of the city's public transportation network. Can you can you expand on that? After which we will take on questions from um, everyone else. Yeah. Uh, Kashmira, can you just uh, repeat the question? Sure. So you mentioned that there is just, there has been a lot of focus on the infrastructure of the BRT. Mm -hmm. And right before this webinar, Shreya and some of us were having this discussion about how the BRT should really not be treated as a standalone infrastructure but really a part of an integrated public transport system of the city. Right. So I just was, was wondering if Shreya can expand on how do we bring in the BRT as part of the public transport system rather than a standalone project or that's how it's being perceived. Uh, thanks a lot for that question, Kashmira. Uh, so it's very, very rightfully said, BRT should be seen as part of a larger ecosystem of public transportation. And it's not a panacea by any means. You know, often BRT gets compared to either city buses or to uh, various kinds of rail systems, whether it be metro or even monorail in other places. And I would say it's unfortunate to make these comparisons. Uh, BRT is is one amongst the, the, the many forms of public transportation that a city should consider. Now, I would actually go ahead and say that the primary question is, uh, you know, how, how do we make sure that cities have mobility? Now, rail systems are great when it comes to longer distances on fixed routes. And uh, by all means, cities like Delhi and Mumbai uh, should have long distance rail systems which serve these longer distance trips where a large number of people need to be transported. Uh, and it's not surprising that actually these cities actually have, at least in the initial set of corridors which were created, a fairly good amount of ridership. Now, the point also to remember is that Indian cities, for a variety of reasons, still have a large number of trips which are short in nature. Uh, you know, as, as per data which has been there, uh, which has come out from census, uh, nearly half the trips in cities are actually under five kilometers in length, which means that a, a rail system doesn't necessarily efficiently serve these trips. And we need to have more flexible, more localized, more distributed forms of transportation. And that's where a bus comes into picture. And therefore, uh, you know, buses have a very important role to play. And this is not uh, surprisingly very different from cities worldwide whether it be cities like London or Singapore or Hong Kong, where buses still play a very important role uh, in the public transportation system. Now, the problem comes when these buses are there, but they're stuck in traffic. Like Bangalore, as my colleague Ratnam had shown earlier, has one of the best levels of service of bus availability in any Indian city, and yet those buses are stuck in traffic which means that we need to find ways and means of how to make sure that these buses are no longer stuck in traffic. Now, there are two ways of doing this. Uh, the first way is to make sure that you dedicate space for these buses so that these buses can go faster 
and are not stuck behind other services. And by the addition of a few more features, you can actually create what is called a bus rapid transit system. I don't want to get into the details of what the BRT itself is because my colleague had earlier talked about it. But the point being, buses need a dedicated right of way. The other option, which some cities have chosen, is to put such stringent measures on the use of personal motor vehicles that there are so few on the streets that buses are not stuck in traffic, that there is free, free flow of traffic and therefore buses still continue to serve the citizens well. And these are examples like Singapore or even London to some extent where they do not have BRT and you know a lot of people show these cities as cases where you do not need BRT and yet buses serve well. And I completely agree with them. But the point is that these cities have also made sure that there are very stringent measures on the usage of personal motor vehicles, especially cars, whether it be in the form of fairly high parking charges or even systems like congestion pricing. And in the case of Singapore, uh, things like licensing uh, limits, which is the number of vehicles that the city can have to start with. So if you were to do this, buses will not be stuck in traffic and buses integrated with rail where they make sense, especially in larger cities, can provide seamless service to citizens. Right now, however, that's not how it's seen. You know, metro systems are created on their own. They are often have nothing to do with the bus services. Uh, special purpose companies are created which have nothing to do even with the state transport departments. And so they stand alone as if they are exclusive systems which have nothing to do with the transportation system of the rest of the city. Instead, what Indian city should look at is to create something like the transport for London or the local, tran the, the land transport authority in Singapore, which are these single nodal agencies which manage the entire transportation ecosystem in the city whether it be rail or bus or parking management or even street management and maintenance. That's the direction that we should be heading towards. Uh, thanks for that, Shreya. Um, we'll be taking questions from our audience. Uh, if you would like a specific question to be answered, you can actually upvote a particular question in the Q&A chat box. So let's start off with some of the questions here. Just give me a second. Yeah, you should be able to upvote now. Okay. So um, uh, Abhijit, maybe you can answer this. So we have a question from, um, Gokula Krishnan. Um, one second, sorry. Oh, sorry, That's, it's from Adarsh Yadav. Yes, the BRT may provide solution to today's congestion. I would like to know how the BRTS will affect other users of the road. So maybe Abhish, uh, Abhijit, you can talk about uh, how, how a BRT would impact your pedestrians, your cyclists, your current uh, bus users, and and uh, people in their personal motor vehicles. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Kashmira. Yes, Adarsh, I got your question. So, how the BRTS will affect other users of the road? So, obviously, putting in seven and a half meters on an already existing road is going to take away space from somebody. Now, the point is with a limited right of way available, who will give up their space? In my experience, I've generally found the stakeholder with the least, uh, if I can say stake, are the people who park. So I would, I, I would ideally say that the first people or the first stakeholder to be affected or who should be affected is the people who park are the people who park. But building a BRTS, I think along with the BRTS, we have to be very clear that a high quality pedestrian path can never be compromised. To give you an example in Ahmedabad, 65% of the people who come on the BRTS walk. 
to reach the station. So an absolute must is these pedestrian paths. There, there may be certain narrowing down of lanes for other traffic. Now, most people are uncomfortable with this. The reason why they are uncomfortable is because they feel they will get stuck in traffic. Uh, it is also very natural to be stuck in traffic in the carriageway and to see an empty bus lane next to you and a bus which is going maybe five minutes or 10 minutes at five minute, 10 minute interval. In such a case, the indignation or you know the, the anger, the irritation is justified. So one thing is very clear. If you want to have this space reserved for buses in the middle of the road, you better make sure that you run buses there. And you better make sure that you run them at least three to five minute uh, intervals. Otherwise, you're, it's going to be very difficult to justify. Yeah, anything else on this? I'm just. Uh, thanks, Abhijit. Thanks, Abhijit. I think Shreya would like to add something on that particular point. Yes. Can I? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Kashmira. Uh, I actually want to bring up our, uh, a, a question about the language that we use to describe public transportation or uh, transportation in general. You know, oftentimes when a BRT is proposed, the immediate question that comes up is that, oh, road space will be reduced for the public. I've heard this from many people saying road space will be reduced by for the public. Now I ask, who is this public? Now the public in this case, the assumption is that these are people who are on cars and motorcycles. And somehow we've now come to say or let car users and motorcycle users appropriate the term public, even though as per the census, which can gather data on transportation tells us that only about one quarter of all trips actually in urban areas are on cars or motorcycles. Actually, the number of trips on cars are just about 5%. In which case, now the question is, who is public? Is the one quarter who are on cars and motorcycles the public? Or is it the three quarters who are walking or cycling or are using public transportation and here I use the term public transportation widely to include not just bus and rail, but also informal transit, which is share auto rickshaws, electric share auto rickshaws, and so on and so forth. They are the public. They are the majority of people who are on the street. And yet we think they do not deserve street space. The one quarter who are there are the term public from whom space is being taken away. It is a little hilarious for me to hear a term like this. So I would actually say that when you create a BRT lane, you're not taking away space from anybody. You are reclaiming space for the majority who are using a more environmentally friendly mode of transportation. So whether you're creating it for a BRT or for a footpath or a cycle track, because they deserve to have an equal amount of space as do people who are on cars or motorcycles. And that's the direction that we really need to move towards. Having said that, unfortunately, the people who can make decisions or the ones who have the voice are the ones who are this minority, especially the ones who are sitting in cars, who then make a noise about how they have the right to be on the road or they have the right to have the entire road for that matter and sometimes or many times actually get away with it. And therefore we need to change this whole paradigm of how we speak about transportation. I'd also like to say here that the point of BRT, you know, uh, you know when the BRT is done well, the bus lanes will not be congested. They're not meant to be congested. They're meant to provide free flow for buses. And the rest of the traffic will get congested. BRT is not a solution for congestion in the cities. 
BRT is a solution to make sure that those who are on public transportation will get high quality rapid transit to get what they need. The answer to congestion is to put restrictions on the usage of personal motor vehicles. And that can be done through parking management or even means like congestion pricing as some cities have done. Thanks for that, Shreya. Um, we have the next question from Chetan and I would like to break that question into two bits. And the first bit, uh, and the first bit, if uh, Abhijit can expand on. So Pune aims to plan a HCNTR ring flyover with the central BRT. And Abhijit, and so the question is, is it even, is it really useful to have this flyover and this BRT? And um, Abhijit, you mentioned in your presentation that, for example, in Ahmedabad, there were some 50 flyovers planned in 10 years, and many of them actually happened to be on the BRT corridor. So from your experience, can you talk about how useful is a flyover on a BRT corridor? Yeah. So to answer Chetan's question about the HCMTR in Pune and putting a BRTS on the HCMTR corridor. Whatever I've heard about this corridor, it's supposed to be an elevated expressway kind of a corridor with uh, ramps to take vehicles on and off. I am absolutely not in favor of doing anything like that. One is, is that HCMTR corridor being planned has the network, has the alignment been planned for public transport or for other vehicles to move fast? Anything else saying that we will have a BRTS along with that HCMTR corridor is trying to fool people. To get, uh, you know, to get permission to build that corridor or whatever. And similar things had happened in, in Bangalore where they were planning to build those elevated corridors to the city center and later said that, oh, we, this is also going to have buses on them. No, no, we don't want planning to happen like this. There has to be a proper plan done based on which the network, the routes have to be planned. And not that first I plan an elevated corridor and then say I'll have BRT also running on there. To put it very straight, that stupidity. Whether it helps in Ahmedabad? No, it does not help. See, in Ahmedabad, many of these corridors, many of these flyovers were not built for BRTS. They were built for other traffic. So the BRTS remains at grade. It has to cross a signal while other traffic can fly overhead. Now that defeats the very purpose of building the BRTS in the first place. What's the point if you are incentivizing private transport? In fact, if you had, an, had the occasion, if you have the opportunity, I would rather put the BRTS on top if you want to build a flyover at an intersection. But then you will have problems because the bus stations need to be at the intersection. Now, Ahmedabad built one flyover, which is the longest flyover in Ahmedabad, about a couple of kilometers. And the original proposal in Ahmedabad was that it would be a BRT only flyover. It would have only buses going on top. It would have a bus station on top connected by escalators and elevators to the road below. Unfortunately, after the corridor got built, there was a lot of public and media attention saying that if you have built such a big flyover, why are you restricting it, restricting it only for buses? And eventually, the decision makers allowed all traffic to go on that. So now we have buses mixed with other traffic running on that corridor. So I would not do that, Chetan. Thanks, Abhijit. The second part of the question, Shreya, um, in, in a lot of cases, you have a BRT and a metro along the same corridor. So the question really comes up as, if, if a metro, why a BRT? And if a BRT, why a metro? Do we need these two systems working on, uh, operating on the same corridor? Uh. So there, there could be two situations in which you might have a BRT and a metro 
or some form of rail on the same corridor. Uh, just to give an example, uh, in Chennai, uh, there is the highest used suburban rail line in the city is one which goes towards, which is southbound from the central station, which is in the north, towards a southern location called Tambaram and onwards. Now, there's a fair amount of ridership on this line with a fairly frequent suburban rail line. And yet, on the same corridor, uh, which is called Anna Salai, which extends towards the airport and further down, also happens to be the most used bus corridor in the city. When I say bus corridor, I don't mean that there is a bus rapid transit system there. It's a corridor on which there are a substantial number of buses with demand ranging from 11,000 to nearly 15,000 passengers per hour on a road on which the rail also exists. So I think we need to be clear that there sometimes is demand where both systems are required. But I would actually say a more important uh, distinction here is that buses often provide short to medium distance trips in a more flexible form providing direct connections to wherever people need to go which the rail system by itself is not able to provide by the very you know structure of how the rail system is created it's meant to provide along that particular rail corridor very high capacity, but only along the rail corridor. As against that, a bus can have a more decentralized, flexible routing system. And if that those routes happen to also be parallel to the rail line in certain sections, it makes sense to also have BRT on those sections to make sure that the buses are not adversely affected by the traffic on those stretches while providing high quality service to those people whose principal trip is not entirely along the rail line, but has different origin and destinations with a certain portion overlapping with the, the rail line. And therefore a bus is important. And that bus we should make sure is not stuck in traffic and therefore BRT becomes an important answer. Thanks. Thanks for that Shreya. Uh, the next question is for Ratnam and it's by Shankar. So Hyderabad is planning an elevated BRT. What is your view on that? And Ratnam also happens to be from Hyderabad. So it'll be very interesting to hear his viewpoint on that. Okay. Um, see the justification here for building the elevated BRT is that there isn't enough space on that road. Uh, or we're taking away uh, the road space up from uh, private cars. Uh, I feel uh, that is not the right way to look at it. Uh, in fact, uh, the specific road on which they're building this right now didn't even exist in 2007, right? Until 2014, when the uh, 2010, in fact, uh, when when the traffic started growing on that road, uh, they started building flyovers, uh, and we induced traffic. We did not invest in public transport in that part of the city, right? Um, and now we're saying, okay. Uh, after, after all of this was done and space was taken away by building flyovers, we're proposing to build an elevated corridor here. Um, I don't think it is fair. Um, they should still try and build up. It is good they're think, thinking of a, a mass rapid transit option here, but I think there is still uh, opportunity now to build an at grade BRT and also improve the uh, city bus system itself uh, in the west, western parts of Hyderabad. Uh, I think uh, Shreya would like to add on that point as well. Uh, just to add to what Ratnam said, thank you Ratnam for answering that question. Uh, one important point that he brought about was that many of these roads actually have not existed in the past. And uh, both Abhijit and I have been uh, you know, giving guidance to cities, telling them that especially when you create new road infrastructure, in the periphery of the cities, it's extremely important to ensure that there's space that's dedicated for public transportation in the form of bus lanes uh, available to, uh, to augment or to add BRT as and when uh, it makes sense for the city to actually add the BRT rather than letting it 
get filled up with cars because streets can get filled up with cars very quickly without adding much capacity in terms of people. Uh, but, and therefore it's important to, to ensure that that space remains for the real public, which is people who are on public transportation or who are walking or cycling right from the start. Thank, thank you, Shreya. Thank you, Ratnam. Uh, we have a question by Reema, and maybe Shreya, if you can talk about this. How do you propose a unified body for, uh, the most questions moved a bit, sorry. How do you propose a unified body for managing transport where in India we have a local state and a central body managing different types of um, transportation projects? Hi, Reema. Uh, good to have that question from you. Uh, now, that's certainly uh, one of the most difficult problems that we have in India, that there's a huge fragmentation of bodies which have a role to play in transportation. Uh, there's, there was a small little analysis. We did this for Delhi and we found out that there were a, a sum total of 18 agencies which had something to do with urban transportation in the city of Delhi. Now, Delhi might seem like uh, you know, an extreme case, but even in other cities, there's a huge fragmentation between uh, agencies. And it's not just a question of national state and city. There is even fragmentation within state level and city level agencies uh, in terms of you know, who, who is responsible for what. Uh, the answer, of course, as in all of us know, is to have a unified body. But obviously, this unified body would also mean that someone who presently has a certain level of power, and power also comes from the amount of money that is available to spend, will lose out on it. But if we want to get our cities on the right track, there is no option but to have a unified body. Now, cities like Singapore and London, which have agencies like the Land Transport Authority, as well as the Transport for London as agencies, did not always have them so. Like L, the, the TFL only came into being about 20 years back. And before that, transportation was in shambles. There were multiple agencies which were running multiple uh, rail systems and multiple uh, bus service providers who were there in the city and transportation was in a bad shape. And that's when, when London had a new legislation to have a unified mayor uh, and the system of mayorship was brought back. That's when Transport for London also came to be a part of this. And therefore, we should think about how such dramatic transformational legislation could be brought about where the single entities provided not just planning authority, but also the the keys to the bank, if you will, to make sure that anything that's done is based on a unified plan for the city and money would be dispersed only when that the, 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 third, the said project is aligned with the plan. Now, none of the Indian cities are anywhere close to this, but there are certainly some cities which are trying to get there. And I would say Chennai is one of those cities which is trying to get there, which has a Unified Metropolitan Transport Authority created through an act uh, in 2010. And there has been talk in recent months about how a TFL could be created. And there was even recently a meeting which happened between TFL and uh, authorities in Chennai. So, so let's hope that uh, cities like Chennai or maybe it might be some other city will end up creating that model example of how to get a Unified Metropolitan Transport Authority right and other cities will emulate it. Thank, thanks a lot for that, Shreya. So just bearing in mind, we have some 40 questions and we have already gone over time. So I think we can take two more questions. And um, so one question is by Apurva and I'd like to direct that towards Abhijit. Route rationalization or last mile connectivity, which is a bigger issue for failure of a BRT? And I'm not sure whether it's either or, or it's both. So Abhijit, would you like to talk about that, please?
Okay. So again, as as Kashmir said, I don't think they you can look at them as either or. I think both are equally critical uh, for a BRTS. Uh, you need root rationalization, uh, especially if you already had an existing bus system like Ahmedabad had or Pune has. Uh, you need to rationalize, uh, you know, to take care of the new reality when you have a BRTS system. Uh, at the same time, and this is where most of our failures have happened, is in the last mile connectivity. Somehow, as I said earlier, we, we believe that this is a project and just building the infrastructure means job done. No, it doesn't work like that. Uh, we have to look at last mile connectivity, whether it means like in Pune and hybrid system, the same bus goes outside the corridor to access destinations or whether it means as in the case of Bogota, where you have smaller buses, which help uh, transfer people for the last mile. I think both are equally important. I don't think we can say one is more than the other. I can say for sure Ahmedabad suffers in both cases. Neither of them is working in Ahmedabad. Thanks, Abhijit. Um, so on that note, we'll have to wrap up this webinar. So uh, thank you, Ratnam, Abhijit, and Shreya. Um, just to quickly sum up, I think, Ratnam, thank you so much for presenting on the basics of BRT, where you need to get these basics right if you are to implement a successful BRT. And as Abhijit mentioned, as Abhijit, Abhijit mentioned, there have been several things that went wrong in some of our cities, but there is no reason why cities cannot learn from these mistakes. And if they are to implement a BRT, learn from these cities and implement a high quality uh, bus rapid transit in their city. And Shreya summed it up really well by talking about how a BRT is, is really not a standalone infrastructure, but it should really be a part of our public transport ecosystem in our city. Um, lastly, I just want to thank you all for attending this webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. And should you like to continue attending some of our webinars, please do not forget to register for our upcoming webinar, which is on complete streets. On, and you can register via our website. Uh, and if you just click on urban law, you should be able to register for that immediately. Um, and lastly, thank you so much, Abhijit, for co-hosting this webinar with Ratnam and Shreya. And we have lots of questions. So this is definitely a very popular topic that we may just call you back to um, answer a lot more questions from our audience. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Thank you very so much. On that note, thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Bye-bye.